If fantasy football started in week four, this is how we would redraft the first two rounds. The 101. I'm taking Saquon Barkley. He is uh, who I had there. We've seen so far already this year the amount of work that Saquon has got. He is winning people weeks. I, he just won Adam a jersey here on this channel. I just I don't About really to win know. Me a jersey though. Didn't take long. I just don't <laughs> know what the argument would be for anybody other than Saquon so far after what we've seen through the first three. I think that's fair. I think the only one I could possibly argue with, had things gone a little differently, is who you took at number two. Brees. Yeah, I mean, you could you could argue that the Saquon's production doesn't necessarily stay here, but Brees, I think, has the volume Brees has and the offense he has, he could end up producing for the rest of the season as much as Barkley does. I think these guys, to me, are the two go-get-your RB hammer um, in uh, fantasy this year. Right yeah, now. and that's why, like, Brees felt really good pre-draft where I was like, I'll get him as my one guy, and then I can kind of fade the position for a long time afterwards. The Braylon Allen situation is the difference for me there, where it's like – Brees is going to be fine. You know, he's going to put up your 18, 20, whatever a week PPR. But Allen makes sure that he never gets to that, like, 30-touch workload. Do you, do you think Braylon Allen's workload is going to continue to increase, or do you think that there's a realistic opportunity that Brees ends up being him and Braylon Allen has to go to the wayside? No, I think Allen's role is here to stay. So a little bit of a pest. Yeah, I think uh, Yeah, I think he'll definitely be a pest. It, it's kind of been annoying just because he's getting a lot of, like, valuable touches where he'll, like, randomly get in for, you know, touchdowns Touchdown. and stuff yeah. where it's like – Realistically, Brees could have had multiple multi-touchdown games. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen the ceiling game out of Brees, which is like kind of annoying. He's been great, but like we haven't seen that 25, 30-point game where we've seen that from from Saquon already a couple yeah. times. Well, and the, the difference, like you said, there's not a soul behind Saquon Barkley that's seeing the field. Right. Will and, who? I, and I think the Jets <laughs> will um, – will progress as a team as the season goes by. We're already seeing, I feel like, week to week, we're seeing Rodgers get better. The O-line has to mesh a little bit as well. So, like, I'm not worried about Brees whatsoever, but I think the difference between them is, like, the, the ceiling for both these guys. Saquon's a little bit higher. So Let me, let me ask you guys a quick question on this. Do you, This might sound crazy, but do you think that say, we haven't even necessarily seen the best of Saquon yet this year? Uh, or do you think that I mean, like, that how three much better touchdown could game that's in week asking, one yeah. was pretty no, crazy. That's, that's what I'm asking you. How much better could he get? A four-touchdown game? <laughs> I mean... It could get sizably better. You think so? I, I don't actually know. I'm, I'm I'm asking if you think there's more upside to be had, or this is basically what we're you could possibly hope for. I'm asking like what literally, literally, what does that mean? Like he's already the one on one. How much more upside could he have? I'm saying relative to the pack. That's what I'm saying. How, can he can he get further away from the pack than he is right now? Mm. I think so. I guess yeah. Because I I feel like it's hard to say that because right now he's already exceeding expectations so much. But I feel like right now because he's one of the few running backs that's getting all the work, and he he's in an offense that is good. So I, th I think it's fair because, like, you saw week one when he scored three touchdowns, and that was kind of on the sloppy field. That was when they were at full strength, when they had A.J. Brown, Devontae. Right. So maybe when they're back at full strength and, you know, they're really clicking, like, yeah, maybe maybe there is a world where it's like he's a two-touchdown-a-week guy. I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like there's a chance where he's actually a bigger difference from the field than we think. I, maybe. I agree, and I, as somebody who drafted him in Idiot League Mates, like, I feel like when I'm throwing him in my lineup, I'm just expecting, like, 25 points now yeah. every time he's in my lineup. Just like this year's C-Mac. It's just like, set it, forget there you it. Go. He's going to win me my week some weeks. Yeah, for sure. He's done that a couple times for you now. Yeah. Uh, we move on to three. And I'll be honest with you, like, after the first two picks, it feels like a fucking crapshoot at this point. Yeah, it does. I, I took Justin Jefferson at three. If you guys want to draft, like, going forward, similar to what we're doing right now, Underdog just relaunched their best ball resurrection game on their platform, which is literally starting best ball right now through the end of the season. So you could also do what we're doing here and start redrafting teams, knowing what you know now and using it as if you're going forward with it. I think the regular season is now through week 14 and then 15, 16, 17 are the playoff weeks. So if you're not on underdog yet, if you were doing best ball drafts with us all summer, then obviously you already have the app downloaded. If you are new, uh, it is, you know, the only place that you could actually probably redraft teams, especially ones for money and actually compete against people for high prizes. Uh, when you download the Underdog Fantasy app, you can use our code BDGE. They'll hit you with a fat deposit bonus, depending on how much you put down. You're also going to get a Patrick Mahomes free square against the Chargers this upcoming weekend. All right, so literally just complete one pass. You're a winner on there, so you could do your best ball resurrection. You can get the Patrick Mahomes half a yard passing. And uh, at the 103, I will take... Justin Jefferson. And I, part of it feels like it's just kind of on the backbone of Minnesota, just so far 
exceeding expectations. Like, they don't have Jordan Addison. They don't have TJ Hawkinson. So he's getting a lot of targets. But even then, he's not having any, like, he did have, you know, the basically 100-yard touchdown catch. But he's not having, like, the 10 for 170 games that, like, we've seen Jefferson right. have. So it almost feels like his ceiling is, you know, like, what is his ceiling on a weekly basis? He's been really consistent. So similar to Brees. He's found the end zone every single week. Right. Like, so he, exactly. He's been yeah. similar to Brees where it's like, you know, he's consistent. You know, he's going to give you really good games. But maybe the upside is capped a little bit in that offense. He definitely has felt like the safest of the elite wide receivers to just keep throwing in your lineup. Yeah. I think you probably have the argument with Amon Ra as well. Outside, the week one was bad, but he's been really yeah. good since then. I, I think the thing to keep in mind for him where the upside could be higher is Minnesota's 3-0 and and they've won every, like, I know Andrew doesn't want to hear this, but there's going to be some games where they're down and trailing. I think there's going to be some situations where Jefferson in comeback mode could end up being him. That's fair. Is that's there ever going to be a game where they're trailing? <laughs> Again. That, that's fair. No, that's a that's a super good point because they haven't beaten <laughs> the fuck out of teams so far, so you haven't seen that like catch-up mode yet. Uh, this felt actually like the grossest pick of the entire draft. I think if we could redo this, I took Bijan at the four. So basically we did every, you know, three picks, rotated it, but since I was the third pick, I did a snake draft. We did a snake draft, so I was also the three and four pick. Uh, yeah, I took Bijan here. That... Looking back, that feels like the wrong pick. Bijan, okay. Bijan has not been what I think people like. He is aesthetically the people, the, the thing that people want. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we, the people, love Bijan. He's the RB sixteen yeah. in full PPR right now, and he's catching passes. Their schedule gets a lot better. Second half of the year schedule for Atlanta is phenomenal, and I think he'll have. Say that I don't think people re say that one more time. He's the RB what? Sixteen. 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 He's played all three games. He's been playing eighty five percent of the snaps. You know, it's not like Tyler Algier is vulturing him or anything like that. The offense is he, he's not making big plays realistically. Like he'll get sixteen carries and average four point nine yards per carry. But like you got to get in the end zone. You can't just go like four for thirty every week through the air. Like you need some like five for seventy five games through the air and stuff like that. And it doesn't mean he can't have it. But at this point, Bijan has not lived up to the hype of what people wanted him to be this year. I, I don't th think Atlanta's offense has lived up to what I, people agreed. Thought. I think I think actually, though, I get the reason you say that, and I know you're tied to it with the Atlanta thing. I, I, I was skeptical about Atlanta coming in. I was like one of the few people I felt like. I think right now what you're talking about, though, you're, you are chasing what you can hope for for the rest of the season. It's yeah. not just the what happened the past three weeks. So I think right now when you look at it, to me, the reason if you were going to argue for it, and I still think you could because there are so many different receivers that are similar, Bijan right now to me is the clear-cut other workhorse back that's not had the production to meet that – uh, said volume right now. No, I, I agree with that. There just feels like when I watch him and watch them play, and it's probably a matter of them not having enough games together, it feels like there's just something a little bit off. They're out of sync. Yeah, you're like, why isn't Bijan not producing like an elite running back? And it doesn't feel like, oh, it's just unlucky, like a couple things here, a couple of things there. You're like, Ugh. it feels a little stale, and you're why not really sure why. Why is Darnell Mooney the wide receiver one here? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You mean he's Arthur's gone. Don't do what this. What a signing. All right, we'll move on to pick number five. I believe that was you, Adam. Yeah, I, I took Amon Ra here. I mean, you could certainly make the case for CeeDee Lamb or Jamar Chase. I, I think the same way that you felt about Jefferson, I felt the exact same way here at receiver. There's not really a necessarily a wrong option. I think there's probably three or four people you could make the case for here. I, I, I lean Amon Ra still, though, because I think the thing with him is their offense has enough weapons to where you can focus on Amon Ra and take him out like you saw in week one, but they're, they're going to beat you elsewhere. A lot of the, like CD, there is no one else in Dallas that defenses have to worry about. Yeah, Jamar Chase, I mean, T. Higgins is back. We'll see, but I, I think that's what, to me, actually is, you could argue is a negative, I think is a positive, where Amon Ra St. Brown might end up getting less attention because the whole offense has more to feed. Detroit playing week one. All I can remember the is game that he Tampa? Game. He struggled. Was it, Was it Tampa? That sounds right, actually. Well, whoever it was. No. No, that was the game they passed the ball. Uh, that was, that was uh, the Rams. Game. The Rams. The Rams. Okay, interesting. Yes. Yeah, he should have had a big game, I guess. He should have. I, the, the reason I bring that up is because Amon Ra, he's been really good these last two weeks. If he had, you know, that six for 75, one touchdown game in week one, I think there's a chance that we're arguing him up at the one or two. Yeah. yeah. You sure. know what I mean? Like, I, I think that he's as consistent as they come, and I feel about as good as anyone uh, as I do in Amon Ra. So five feels fitting. Yep. Yeah, so at six, I took CeeDee Lamb, and look, I understand CeeDee Lamb hasn't necessarily had the huge blow-up game. We've had some good performances, 13 points, 19 points. Like, it's it hasn't been wide receiver one overall type of stuff, but at the end of the day, like, 
there hasn't been too much that still has changed about the situation. We still expect CeeDee Lamb to be force-fed targets throughout the year. We still expect him to have a, a heavy target share. And I just looked, obviously we only have three weeks of sample size, but you look at the schedule down the stretch for uh, CeeDee Lamb, there's a lot of green. It's you just like, the, when do they play Washington and New York? You want to know when they play those guys? They play the Giants this week. They play Washington in Week 12. They play the Giants in Week 13. They play Washington in Week 18, so that's not going to matter for us Ooh, in fantasy. That's such an L. But you that get sucks. Week 15 and 17 against Carolina and Philadelphia, who's been um, giving up a lot of points, too. So your championship weeks, CeeDee Lamb's going to have some good defenses, and yeah. he's already an elite wide receiver. My only concern with Lamb, and like obviously top six pick, whatever, Nitpicking. up to this point of the season, it feels like similar to Garrett Wilson in New York. Their offense is so one-dimensional. They have no ground game, and like Jake Ferguson's been good. But they don't, like, if you're a defensive coordinator, you're only job that week is to be like, how do we eliminate CeeDee Lamb? Yeah. You know what's crazy? That scares me a little bit. That that I agree with, and I think you're feeling it this year. Last year, see, the, the offense was started to be run heavy, and then they pivoted midseason into much more pass heavy, and CeeDee was the focal point. This year, it's very clear and obvious, and I also, you know, he the holdout situation, I don't know how much that's lingering, but True. I'm not going to act like CeeDee's not the person that you could take here, but uh, he doesn't right now, at least to me, this could all change in a single week, but he doesn't seem to be that same outrageously different from the pack receiver that we saw last year. Yeah, and, and to be fair, though, like he wasn't that at the beginning of the year last year. It sure. was the second half of the year that we saw a breakout, so like, you know, maybe there's something to that as well. And, and they maybe. also were in like comeback mode all last game, and I don't know, he, he just didn't feast with it. Yeah, I, yeah. I just think it's every defense is like cornerback, press coverage, safety over the top. Which is why, and, and to be fair, like that's why you're seeing Jalen Tolbert get peppered with targets. Like, yeah, yeah make that guy beat you. Ferguson right. looked good last week. Which I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to jump a pick, but you know what that sounds a lot like, just mm. in a better offense, maybe is neighbors a little bit. Andrew, you want to like you want to double make down? Your pick or Jamar? I just did C D Lamb. Oh, I guess I had back to backs, right? Yeah. So my other one, I guess number seven is why I went Jamar Chase. I don't really care which way we go with the six and seven, but I I do prefer I guess C D Lamb. Jamar is the came or the same kind of idea. We saw the blow up week here against Washington. We kind of saw that coming from a mile away. Uh, but that being said, I just feel like Jamar Chase. You drafted him to be an elite wide receiver. He's still going to be an elite wide receiver. And even though the Bengals have had struggles to start the year, I can't imagine I'm taking many other wide receivers over him for the remainder of the year, either in fantasy. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else to add there. It's like, could have been worried about him for a week or two, but he just did what Jamar Chase does in good matchups. He'll have great games, and now T. Higgins back. Like It helps when you have you know, healthier offensive options around you. Yeah. Eight is where he gets spicy. Eight's where I, you could say it gets spicy for sure. You I had to talk Adam off the ledge here. He wanted to take Malik at two. I, yeah, <laughs> there was a little dynasty redraft confusion. <laughs> but at the same time, like, obviously I'm not going to argue for him at two. But you guys tell me. Obviously we saw wide receiver 32 in week one. I, I'm not going to act like these last two weeks are what the floor is. But with the floor of what he's likely to have, with the upside that we've seen these last two weeks – like, what's the staying power for you as far as your view of Malik Neighbors in the kind of elite tier here at receiver? I mean, I'm, yeah. just, I'm genuinely curious where you guys are at. No, he's so good. Like, his <laughs> talent his talent feels to be – like, I think he's in the Justin Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb talent he, he, just as a receiver. It's almost hard to – I think at this point we've already seen enough in three weeks to argue that, that he's not. Like, yeah. he's, he is definitely an elite, elite player. Um, yeah, and then, and then doing it versus Cleveland was also another, like, okay, if if they were going to struggle, this would probably be a game that they would struggle in versus defense. And I guess we're still early enough in the season where it's like – Maybe we don't know what defenses actually are. In eight weeks, we'll be able to look back and be like, all right, maybe Cleveland's kind of like a subpar defense. Garrett was very banged up. He didn't seem to get after times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I don't know. They play Dallas, and, like, it's easy to be like, ah, oh, Dallas' defense is not as good. But, like, Michael Parsons should still be able to fucking eat that offensive lineup. It's – I don't know. It's tough to – all that's to say is, like, Malik's doing it versus everyone that's been thrown his way. So it's really hard to yeah. uh, throw him anywhere lower. I agree. I, I think you have to have him in the conversation – in probably the first round right now. I, I think probably the next two guys that were selected, I probably would take over Malik, but those would probably be the only other guys that I'd take over Malik. Actually, there's another guy later in the draft, too, that I probably would take. But okay. I, I still think Malik Neighbors, he's a top 11 pick for me in redraft. He's first round for me. I, I kind of agree with you. He's, he's probably at the bottom of the tier for me, and it's probably like as the season continues to go, he probably Rises steadily more. moves up, but I just want to see more and more of his sample size to know that like this yeah. Daniel Jones – staying powers and fluky but that's fair well I was just gonna say for him the last thing I'll say and where I leaned him ahead of some of these other guys is the thing about Malik Neighbors when I think about last two weeks ago week week two he has 18 targets I mean it was mm -hmm. just ungodly amount mm -hmm. of volume so you're I don't even care if you're a good he's actually on pace for over 200 targets right he it's has crazy. 37 targets relative to the next 
which is uh, 29. And I just think about that. In a game where you know you have to take away one player, number one, you can't. not only do you not take him away, he goes for 12 targets, two touchdowns. Like, the floor that he has with all the target volume that you're going to have to force to him, as well as some upside, I mean, it's hard for me to argue it, anyone else, It feels else, like honestly. it should be easy to take him away. But what if you just... Just because you know, just because you know that what's coming doesn't mean you can stop it. I guess. Now I know it sounds crazy. And I think the Giants' the offense is not very good. So. Like if any team just wants to watch the film of Kansas City, what they did to Cincinnati, like to Jamar Chase, that feels like beat us with your tight end group. Yeah. The other thing is like Malik Neighbors is also making insane catches. Like some right. of those, some of those passes are not great from Dimes. He's just. No mossing people making outrageous plays it's insane that touchdown he had on the sideline he had to go up and get that way higher than he should have like yeah. he's making plays too no yeah. no for sure like Malik is just um, I think in like a year or two we're, we're easily just gonna have that conversation of is it Jefferson or Malik as the best yeah. receiver in the NFL at this point yep uh, my next two picks as you said were kind of in the same tier they're two wide receivers at nine I took Nico at 10 I took Rashi Rice and to be honest as I was looking back when I was talking about how I like regretted taking Bijan at four. I genuinely think because all these next receivers kind of feel like they're in the same tier to me, I'm almost like I wish I just took like Nico at the four instead of Bijan there. And I don't think there's a wrong way to go here. Nico is the clear separation of the wide receiver one there in Houston attached to CJ Stroud. We've seen nothing but just like big game after big game after big game for him. Uh, and then Rachi Rice is leading the NFL in receptions, I believe, up to this point. He mm-hmm. is completely overtaken Travis Kelsey as the number one target for Patrick Mahomes. It's literally like slant 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 big play down the field he's a he's a 10 catch per week type of dude uh floor of like 18 to 20 points in ppr league so i went nico at nine i went rashi rice at 10 just attach really good receivers to really good quarterbacks and you'll probably have a really good fantasy team rice might be one of the single best picks anybody could have made this year facts for sure i mean right now i I think the thing with rice is he is so far and away with kelsey's lack of involvement so far the clear and undisputed alpha in an offense that's led by Mahomes so it's hard to not to mention what we've already seen it's hard to argue for uh anything but sincere upside for him uh I took Devon A. Chain next pick I think here like A.J. Brown obviously hurt I I strongly considered Harrison and and Godwin these next two picks as well but I feel like A. Chain while last week was not great and Miami's offense certainly is not the same as it once was I, I still believe he has some ridiculous upside to be had and right now he's even on a bad week getting 17 touches like, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I debated I, overthink it. I debated going HN here but I looked at like the remaining guys left and I was like okay if I sit on HN I could still get one of the top like a probably like a James Cook or an Alvin Kamara or something with the running backs on the turn there so I ended up like kind of drafting as if I was going like tier based a little bit gotcha HN yeah I mean the, the only hesitation here if Tua was healthy right now, I think A-Chan's probably a top five pick. He's in, he's in, honestly, I think A-Chan, if Tua's healthy and this over offense looks good, is, is in the conversation with Bijan, if not over. Yeah, I, I agree. So, again, the way we're drafting is if, like, your fantasy league started in, in week four, right? right yeah. So it's not like we're going back and predicting what's happening or anything like that. It's like week four to week 18, that's how you're playing your fantasy league. So Devon up there, of course, a little scary without Tua's timeline. We don't know if that offense can really, like, produce, et cetera. But, I mean, he's been as good as advertised. Agreed. Yeah. I went at 12 with A.J. Brown. Uh, I just feel like A.J. Brown, based off of what we saw week one, I know he's dealt with the the hamstring injury, and he's probably going to miss week four, which we're in, and then he has a bye week in week five, so you get two weeks here without A.J. on your team. But after that, how does it sound having a wide receiver who in week one finishes the wide receiver seven, had 10 targets, 120 yards, a touchdown? I think I'll tell you how it feels. It sucks. It sucks to It have sucks. Him. Get back on the fucking field. My mm, my I just God. think A.J. Brown, you know, when I – He's one of these guys that we have to talk about in the same conversation as, you know, the Amon Ra's and these other guys. He was like, set up for a monster year if he didn't get fucking he's, hurt. He's, he's still probably going to have a good back half That feels of the like 2024. Well. Yeah. I just, I love everything about A.J. Brown. I, I think he's going to elevate this offense when he comes back. It's sure. The Eagles haven't even looked that great, you know, the two weeks that he hasn't been on the field. So uh, he was my pick there at 12. And then going at 13, this is where I took Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, there was a lot of panic in the streets week one. Where, you know, you got everybody on the internet talking about, well, did you know he ran 16 miles an hour? I tell you what, 16 miles an hour didn't matter too much in week two, and it didn't matter too much in week three because Marvin Harrison Jr. balled out in both of those weeks. He looks like a true number one. I don't think that there should be any reason to be worried about Marvin Harrison Jr., and he's only going to continue to get better and to continue to be fed by Kyler Murray in this offense. They're going to be in a lot of games where they're playing fast, they're scoring a lot of points. Marvin Harrison Jr. is is an actual elite wide receiver one. 
I was going to actually ask, are these interchangeable for you, or do you have A.J. Brown ahead? By uh, they're interchangeable. I don't okay. care. Yeah, I'm, would I'm you with take? you. I would take Marv because he's healthy. Yeah, I'd probably go with that, but I, I think when they're both healthy, A.J. is the, the one I prefer. I would take Brown, too, only because I know they are they got the week five bye, so he'll definitely be healthy after six, and I guess, like, not to project Marv to miss one game, but, like, it'll probably happen eventually. I, yeah. The one thing I'll say is the reason I do lean Marv and he's healthy is soft tissue injuries, while he, he should be healthy after the bye, yeah. it's not always a – would have, could have, should have. That's the reason I just lean that way. Yeah. I, they're they're both great. And if, if AJ they didn't Brown's have healthy, the buy, I'd be a little bit worried. But I, I do think like that'll be almost like a month for the hamstring. It just makes the more you sit and think about like how they've handled this injury, it just makes sense the way they've been doing it. Yeah, I hate it, <laughs> Marv. All right, Adam. Chris Godwin for me here. Um, I know this is probably going to be like what pick is it? Just this say was the, a say the pick. Chris Godwin. This is the 14th pick overall. This is a easily the biggest mover I think at this point. Shout out to Chris Godwin, brother. But like, I mean, am I crazy here? No, not at all. Okay, because he is uh, – I, I was in on him because he's going back to the slot, and I, I thought there would be a better season to be had. I, I think you'd be crazy. Anyone that's trying to tell you they saw this coming is probably lying. Yeah. This dude is him right now, honestly. Like, he's not in the same tier, I think, as the, the guys ahead because they do carry more upside than Godwin. But, man, th- this game this last week I think is a big telling sign to me about Godwin's year so far. That that offense was abysmal. They, they were doing absolutely nothing. And then Godwin still comes away and salvages a very good fantasy day. Yeah, That, I think, is uh, – He hasn't missed yet. No, I, but if you're having a – if that whole offense is looking scary, like no one's going to produce, and then he still does well in that week, that that is a very good sign for me the for Chris Godwin. The floor for Chris Godwin is just so high right now. Like, it, it feels like – just kind of how I said with Saquon, like you're plugging Saquon and just expecting 25. Like I feel like we're plugging Godwin in, like expecting 20 in PPR. It feels like I'm on Ra a little bit, like an old version of him. Yeah. Yeah. What? What? So right now this is what like wide receiver 10. 10. Do you guys agree with that? Disagree with that? As the receivers that you would argue ahead? Uh, the guys that went ahead of him, I would still take all of those guys ahead. Sure. Um, behind, I guess I'm asking more so. I don't really have an issue with this yeah, at all. I, I think it's exactly the right spot, yeah. probably. Okay. Uh, the next two picks, I went running back, running back, and I think they're probably interchangeable to me. Uh, I took James Cook at the 203 and then Alvin Kamara at the 204. James Cook has been as good as any running back in, in fantasy pretty much right now, especially coming off of you know multi-touchdown games. They are – the Buffalo Bills are the best team in the NFL right now. Josh Allen is the front runner for the MVP. And what's most surprising – is that James Cook is getting like all the work inside the five yard line, inside the ten yard line? So he's scoring touchdowns at like a crazy rate. He has four touchdowns in three weeks. Okay, and that's as many I mean, as last year, right? Or did you have how many did you have last year? Uh, yeah, not very many. I'll pull it up. Yeah, I think. I'll tell I think, you what, he should have more right yeah, now. Yeah, he had two rushing touchdowns on the ground in last had, year. Uh, he actually had four through the air last yeah. year, so he had six all last season. Rushing, he already has more than he did last he year. He could have six right that now. That motherfucker, <laughs> I've never seen a running back. I think I texted the group chat drop wheel routes the way that he does. Mm-hmm. He did that last year like two or three times also, just like a perfectly designed play, get him out there, just through the fingertips. Hands. Always yeah. happens. Yeah. But now he's getting as much work as ever. He looks as good as any running back in the NFL. The scheme is just humming on every basis and doesn't look like they're slowing down at all. So like Cook's one of those dudes, workhorse attached to an offense that you can actually trust for the full year. Don't overthink it It there. might sound overreactive, but like is there a, a single team in the NFL at the moment that can compete with Buffalo? Yeah, I think they've had actually kind of a light schedule early. We'll see. We'll see this weekend. They get uh, Baltimore, so that's a little bit of a right. I, matchup. Now, now, I don't at, at the same. That said, I'm not going to act like what we're seeing from Buffalo. This team looks scary as hell. Like I'm, not, I'm not trying to act like it's not. Nobody expected the defense to look like this. And yeah. then offense, you know, the narrative was like, does Diggs elevate Josh Allen? No, Josh Allen is him. Mm-hmm. Prime, prime time, too. They're just absolutely to the woodshed with Jacksonville. That game was ugly hit quick. Yeah. I want to see what, like, Detroit would do against Buffalo. It's I like think two weeks in a row where Buffalo's like, just, hey, everybody take the jerseys off in the second half. We don't care. Yeah, this it's this next pick, though, while James Cook, I think, is the really exciting of these two backs you took, I don't know what people want out of Alvin Kamara anymore. Like, I mean, what what could you po- – this guy is actually running yeah. back, too. And he's just so good. It's a little bit of, like – yeah, it's like he's too good that we're like, when does it stop? And we, I think we all saw week three from Derek Carr. Uh, well, this is said, coming off of right after week three when James Cook had a big game. Alvin Kamara kind of had his bad game, but his bad game was 29 touches. Yeah. Like, if that's the kind of workload he's going to get, a 20-plus touch per week guy, like we saw it last year where he wasn't, like, good, but he was a 20-touch – per game guy and ended up as like the RB5. So we're getting that again. It doesn't look like, you know, had we start to see like Kendra getting like eight to 10 carries a game, I'd be like, okay, maybe there's something here. Kendra's, I don't think ever going to fucking play for the Saints. And Jamal Williams looks eligible to come back this week. Absolute cone. Full full PPR right now. 22 points in week one, RB6. 44 points (laughs) in week two, RB1. And his bad week, a mere 16 points for running back 15. Yeah. 
The floor so we is might, I might even crazy. be underrating him here, to be For honest. Sure. I mean, I think it's just impossible not to. It's just yeah. like he's not sexy. But it's, yeah, it's it's funny because you look at like A-Chan and stuff, and it's like, do you want to take Kamara over A-Chan? Probably not. You know what it is with Kamara? Might, you're right. That probably was a bad pick, honestly, relative to Kamara, frankly. It's, it's like when the reason I feel like Kamara is like so boring is because like when you're watching Red Zone on Sunday, like when James Cook has a big play or A-Chan has a big play, it's like you're always like watching that game and you see it happen. Kamara's points come in all the time that you're not watching the Saints game where it's like 11-yard dump off, 6-yard dump off. 14-yard dump off, 7-yard run. And then it's like, oh, Alvin Kamara scored a touchdown. Before you know he had 60 yards and a touchdown, you're like, I didn't even see the 60 yards. You know what I mean? It's like, funny because it starts to just pad up. That's a great point, actually, Nick, because you talk about how, like, uh, in, in fantasy football, we say, you know, in between the 20s are not the valuable touches. Alvin Kamara finds the valuable touches. When you're catching passes in, those, in PPR. It in is, those yeah. invaluable ranges. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just happened because everyone else is making explosive plays, big plays, all these, like, you know, high-volume type plays, and Kamara's just catching these little points and, like, peppering you all over the little death by a thousand cuts type beat and I got into the running back tier here too uh, tell me if you guys think this is a bad pick or not I think right now it's debatable um I also don't I don't I don't love anyone after here that's why I end up taking Jameer Gibbs I feel like the upside we haven't quite seen yet from him in three weeks but David Montgomery's presence is real yeah I don't I don't disagree with the pick I think the next guys are all kind of in the tier together it's kind of pick your poison it's like Indy's offense is a little shaky same thing with the Rams offense so it's I probably would have leaned JT over Gibbs here, but I don't really have a problem. Either. I almost, and I was thinking JT, and I ended up going Gibbs because I, I didn't want to be too overreactionary to while he did look great. I don't want to go like one week and flip right. flop values. I think they, I, I, I do think, think he just realizes like we probably have to. We need to we need to not have JT. a rich do this too much where he's got six picks and looking really. He got to stop with that. Hopefully we get a good game from him soon. But the thing with Gibbs, I think the Gibbs the big Gibbs blow up game has not happened yet, and I think when that does, the overreactions will kind of correlate here. Yeah. Yeah, so I was up next at the 206 and the 207. I uh, had the back-to-back picks, and to be honest, when I was making my selection there at the 201, when I took Marvin Harrison Jr., I was looking at some of these running backs because I just felt like they belonged to be in that conversation, but when you looked at that tier of guys, it just made more sense to draft the wide receiver because there was a bigger fall-off than all of these running backs. Right. Like you said, Nick, these are kind of interchangeable. Uh, I go with Jonathan Taylor at the 206, and then at the 207, I went Kyron Williams for the Rams. Now, uh, Taylor, he's just he's looked solid, man. I think they're gonna more likely than not have to start leaning into this run game a little bit more. And uh, Jonathan Taylor's looked pretty efficient in this backfield. He just he always does, and I I think he always uh, performs really well for us. So that's why I went him there. Kyron Williams, uh, he's a guy that I feel like we were a little bit worried about definitely going into. Well, one, going into the season, you know, everybody panicked about the punt returner. Hasn't been an issue. Only Cones did. Yeah. Yeah, And then that being said, we were panicked about, you know, now that Puka's out, now that Nakua's out, the offensive line is banged up, is it going to be able to... You know, is Kyron going to be able to be good? Yeah, I'm still a he little put, bit worried about the situation. He put three touchdowns on his ass. He did. I, I think if you flipped, like, again, you you bring this up almost every player you talk about, is like not to be overreactionary with one week. If you flipped week one with week three, and that was the timeline for it, like, I think we might be looking at Kyron a little bit differently. Potentially. Mm-hmm. So if you if you step back and say, like, okay, he scored three touchdowns and, you know, looked good last week, but now you look at it objectively where it's like, all right, we have three offensive linemen, I, I, our, like our wide receivers are cooked as well. I still think there's enough risk there that I'm, like, a little bit nervous. Fair. I just felt like for me when I was looking at them in the running backs, like, I know – Outside of injury, like Kyron Williams is going to be the starter long term here. Yeah. Like he's going to the whole year, he's going to see a heavy workload. He's going to continue to see the receiving work. Like the rest of the running backs after Kyron Williams, at least in my opinion, they just don't have the same ceiling as Kyron. Yeah. And no, he I, felt like the the pick. There's no clear cut like zero red flag player left. Yeah, I I think that's a good point. I think I I agree with the pick there. I I think what we're seeing though with him is the the. Offense and the inefficiency of his touches right now is what's keeping him out of the other tier of the running backs, in yeah. my opinion. Honestly, the guy at 209, I debated at 207, but I thought I could get him later. Yeah, so I take <laughs> Tyreek Hill here. I, I take both Dolphins, which doesn't feel great, but uh, I feel like at a certain point, I don't want to, again, I I'm, I feel like a broken record, and I probably am at this point. I'm just cooked. I uh, want to be reactionary. Yeah, <laughs> but like, I, I feel like, th- I think there's a chance that we 
I could end, this could end up being a really bad L take. But I think there's a very good chance we look back and that was one of the worst, if not the worst, games Tyreek Hill has for the season. Yeah. I mean, what did he put up? Like fucking four points? He had three touches on five targets. Yeah. Not great. I, I, I would agree great. with that. There's just as good of a chance he goes like seven for 80 and a touchdown next week. And we're like, okay, Tyreek Hill, Tyreek's fine again. Yeah. And he's a guy that I think it's easy to forget when the offense looked so bad last week. But it's a guy, if you just continue to get him the ball in space, he can make crazy plays happen on his own. Yeah, you want to talk about making crazy plays happen? That's Mr. This, Josh dude. Allen at two. It's like if you don't, if you're not watching the game, your phone is just getting destroyed with notifications. Touchdown! 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 Superman. Dude. So we just, I basically just said, there's no players left with no red flags. So for me, it was just like this is a guy that no you put flag. in the top of your lineup and you feel fantastic about it every week. And you know, quarterbacks started to drop in like best ball drafts this year a little bit, where you were getting them in like the fourth round ish. The reason you did that is because they kind of underperformed last year, but we're at the point where Josh Allen is now averaging 26, 27 fantasy points a game. That is a huge advantage, especially in a year where uh, quarterbacks are not performing. They're not throwing passing touchdowns. Like the advantage that Josh Allen is giving you, I would almost say like he could be argued all the way up to the 203, 204, like in, in that range, bro. If you have him at the top of your lineup, you feel fucking fantastic I about would it. maybe even hotter take, but I would feel like there's an argument for Josh Allen as high as 11. Like, I could take him over A-chain and feel comfortable with it. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. The way he's playing, the way Buffalo's playing, like, everything is clicking on top of the fact that the quarterback position itself is so struggling right now. So I went Josh Allen there, and then for the 210, I went Jordan Mason. I know this is kind of a spicy pick. It is. We could talk about C-Mac all day. Uh, here's here's the gist of it. I think we just we heard the report that C-Mac went to you know Germany or whatever to see a specialist. Uh, I don't know how much research you guys have done on that, but the stem cell. The reason he did that, yeah, is because it's illegal to get the stem cells here in America that he's looking for. Well, mm -hmm. I thought it was more so the higher dosage. He could get a higher dosage in Germany than he could get here. But uh, whatever, whatever Something the case like is, that. yeah, whatever he was looking for, he's you not do it out of the country. He's not allowed to get it in America. <laughs> he can get it in Germany, and um, someone did it recently. Someone did what the fuck was it? It was an athlete that did it. Did the same thing. They went to Germany to get the stem cells, and it was very successful and came back quickly because of it. And yeah, it, like people chalk this up as a red flag. It's not really that. I agree. Red flag. I think it was actually a good. I think the report on the surface was scary. You're like, oh fuck, he like must be really fucked if he's going all the way out here to see a specialist or something. Yeah. They have the best doctors in the world at their disposal if they want to use them at in San Francisco, in America, whatever. He's doing this literally because he can't get it done in America. So he goes there. Maybe there's increased risk when you're doing shit like that, and obviously America has it as an illegal procedure for a reason, but like I'm sure he's pretty well vetted in the upside and downside case for it. So I actually don't look at that as such a bad thing. That being said though, like C Mac, it's a little bit scary right now. And we know what Jordan Mason is. San Fran wants to have their offense dictated through the running game and Jordan Mason has been as good as most running backs in I, fantasy right as now. As long so. as he is the starter, he is an RB1 every week. Yeah, for sure. Top five guy, top six, seven guy. Um I think he is someone who I Feel confident in I'm getting like a high end RB one for the next six to eight weeks. I was gonna say because from what I've heard, it feels like CMC is gonna get this treatment or he got the treatment, and then there's about a six week recovery period from the treatment. Yeah, and so it does feel like you're gonna get another month and a half, two months yeah. out of Mason. And maybe that's like cone like behavior, you know, playing for the first half of your season. But like maybe it's longer than that. Maybe it does linger further and and then you have a high-end guy for the whole season also you need to win games and jordan mason's winning you games yeah that's also I, how i'm looking at it i wanted to uh, make a point you were talking about josh allen and so uh the, the warp tool is something i look at a lot so in fade the fetal uh i ran the warp through three weeks and right now you have saquon barkley and uh alvin kamara that are just kind of off the charts and just behind them but also off the charts josh allen relative yeah. to replacements those three guys are just single-handedly helping you win you're weak regardless of the rest of your team. Yeah. Josh Allen is like, people still have that notion in their mind that it's like, oh, it's a quarterback, one quarterback. But I'm like, I've kind of been through this before. The guys who have the high end upside to put you up 30 points a week are uh, just as valuable as any skill position player. Curious if you guys, so while it's a sizable amount between him and number two, curious if you guys would take a guess on who number two is at, in warp and quarterback? quarterback. Yeah. Lamar? Lamar's at number two fantasy QB, I believe. He's actually number three. Okay. It's... Don't tell me it's Super Bowl Sam. Nah. He's, he's five. <laughs> which is he, hasn't, yeah. he hasn't had enough, like, upside games to be there. Fair. Kyler? Jaden Daniels. Nice. Oh, that makes sense, because yeah. week one and week three were both huge boom weeks. Massive, yep. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Anyway. Uh, uh, 211. And we get to Garrett Wilstein. Um, Slant boy. <laughs> you know, it hasn't been what we were hoping for. Um, I was I was watching videos, numerous videos, about how Aaron Rodgers is only going to be able to make this man him. 
and I was on board, and I just, I'm not as out, I think, as some people are. I get it. It's so tiring when you've been told it's going to be Garrett Wilson's year last year and now three games in. I think the volume is something to keep to keep chasing. Right now, another thing with, like, Sertan's matchup this week, which is kind of off track here, but Garrett Wilson's seen 40 to 45%, depending on the games, in the slot, and I think eventually those type of – they're putting him in there for a reason, and they're going to be first reads for Aaron Rodgers. I think some of those are going to start paying off better than they have, but it's definitely not – he is not the play that a lot of the other guys are, I think, where he has a ton of ceiling to be seen so far. Yeah, we need to see more, uh, a few more big plays out of him. The big games will come because Gary Wilson's too talented for them not to. Yeah. And and similar to um, what we were talking about like Bijan, I think this offense also will continue to get better as the season progresses and they yeah. mesh more and, you know, they got the quarterback and all that kind of stuff. So I think the bigger games are yet to come. I just, you know, I want to see them use him in, in ways that like big games are actually possible. It doesn't, yeah. it feels like it's, so much lack of innovation with his usage, though. Yeah, so exactly. And that, that's the scary part is, like, you got Nathaniel Hackett there. It, that's about as lack of innovation as you could have. Yeah. yeah. So. All right, so here at the 212, I, I'm not going to lie. I felt as if when I was trying to make this pick that I got put at the start of the next tier. Like, it felt like Garrett Wilson was the last of the tier, and now I have to make a selection of all of these guys that could potentially be there. What did you have at first? I was toying between, like, Josh Jacobs. I was toying between Derrick Henry. Uh, I thought about Lamar Jackson just because of the way the quarterback position has been. DK Metcalf was in consideration. Mm-hmm. Olave, uh, London. DK's been really good. Like, all yeah. of these guys. So, I, I really, when it came down to it, I was like, I think it's going to be between DK and Derrick Henry. And I settled on Derrick Henry. Uh, really, the reasoning is just everything that we've wanted out of Derrick Henry, for the most part, feels like it's kind of come to fruition. How do you feel? You own Derrick Henry in Idiot League Mates. Like, just as, like, a, you know, when you have guys on your team, you see them differently, and you're like, nah, he's not as actually good as his stats say he is. How are you feeling about Henry right now? So, it's so funny because, like... He had a huge game, so, like, maybe you were feeling yeah, differently no, before that. Yeah, no, it's funny. That. Like, him and A-Chain, as a guy, I have both of them in there. It's one week at the running back position especially can change... Polar views of it. Derrick Henry was in like scary territory. I feel like for people after week after two, week I and thought A chain was going yeah. to the mountaintop. Yeah, and now it's like they're they're converging. It's nice having both of them because you know like one of them is going to give you a thirty point week. Yeah, I mean the the one that, nice part about Henry is that we saw this week that was I think really important that people were very skeptical of is he mm-hmm. does have the King Henry carry. upside. Yeah, yeah. And I think what was nice is too the first two weeks it was like the way the games were scripted. You didn't get to see any type of explosion. He was looking like, is this guy a cone now? Is he yeah. old and done? You got to see some bursts from him. It definitely isn't necessarily the old young Henry, but you still, when you got him out in space, he's a load to bring down. I think with Henry, um, I don't want to get – like you should not – I think if you just saw week three and like this guy's back now, mm-hmm. that's – there's going to be some down weeks still to be had because there's going to be some game scripts where Justice Hill, as you had at a running back cut of the week, yeah, he's going to end up getting a lot of the receiving work. But I think Derrick Henry is just a set it and forget it. When And when he does have the boom, it's going to be crazy. I think the thing with Henry more so that I at least find, I would say, comforting when you make the selection of Derrick Henry here is that you know the goal line work is always going to be there. You know there's going to be a lot of goal line opportunities here with this offense in Baltimore. It's just... I, like I said, it was the beginning of a tier. I think a lot of these guys have conversations to potentially be the pick here as the last one of the second round. The one that I think maybe has the most conversation would be DK. One, one thing I, I, I really like what DK's done. Uh, DK's so far. been looking great. I think Ryan Grubb for that offense has been really good. A boost of Agreed. a boost of upside. But we talked about this at some point early, maybe a month or so ago. Derrick Henry right now. Four touchdowns. Can he go for like twenty touchdowns this season? Mm, I'd say, dude, he, he go. Week, I can't week, wait to see what he does in week, December. Week one, that's going to be the thing. A, week, it's a movie. Week yes. one was, I think, while the first drive was great, the whole week was very disappointing. He still had a touchdown that week. Yeah, yeah. he's had a touchdown every week, right? He's had four touchdowns, one, right. one, and then two last week. Yeah, I mean, that's the offense saying, really like, dictates that. That's always going to be there with him. Like, I feel like even if he has a bad week, it's because he got into the end zone. And he ran for like thirty yards. Yeah, but typically yeah. when you got a guy that has this lack of patch, pass catching upside as him you're like eh, I don't want it but Derrick Henry's goal line touches are just they take over yeah so D Henry I, I I ultimately I think that was the right pick at that's, that spot but DK was definitely like a if I had to turn it would have been DH DK that's what I'm saying like I was toying between all these guys and I'm like a lot of them have an argument but I feel like Derrick Henry is the right choice yeah I, I feel like what what I will say the honorable mention to DK Metcalf it kind of was amazing to me he was such a buy for me in Dynasty this last year mm-hmm. I don't understand how a guy that's that physically gifted Became so boring. People, people just got bored of him, yeah, because he just a, did the same thing over sense. and over again. 
He's yeah. so he's so. I feel like we had to see the upside of him having these long plays. And we saw two of them in the last two weeks. Yeah, I mean, the like that's that, that's where you have to be like really open minded when the scenery changes so drastically, like it did in Seattle, when it's going to go from a Pete Carroll run first offense to an open up the entire playbook, open up the field passing offense. Like those are the types of changes in the off season that you have to be open to, like seeing what happens on the spectrum. Well, and the one thing that I feel like was a major eye opener, and one that I felt like a lot of people needed to see, was that in week two he gets the Sertan matchup. Still performs highly. 14 targets. Yeah. And in the same game, JSN has 16 targets. So, like, you see the breakout from JSN. You see the tough, you know, corner matchup. And he still performs for us. So, like, it was like all of the worries that are there, he can overcome these. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right. So, those are the two rounds. Redrafting. Had we started the season today. Uh, let us know what you agree with, what you disagree with. Please, I already know we all disagree with Bijan Robinson. I regret that. Are there any other picks that you guys regret having made now, looking back at what I, we did? I think uh, the A chain is still worth reaching on for him, but I think I definitely could make the cases for a lot of other guys where I took him at 111. I think yeah. that was a little early. I think it's a little risky. Yeah, I just wish I would have drafted Josh Allen before you because I love Josh Allen. Yeah. <laughs> that one I felt really good about him dropping to me. I was curious to see what he I was he actually going to ask, like, just a lifestyle vibes. You get to pick one player you get to watch for the rest of the season only. Their games. Who is, like, the vibe you want to see the rest of their season, all the plays? You, you were really interested in just think mm. they're the movie to watch. It's Josh Allen for really? me. Okay. So, so for me, me, my favorite player in the league is Justin Jefferson, but, like, very, very close is Josh Allen, and it's always been that way. So his performance so far to start the year, I'm, like, locked in. Yeah, he's been red hot. No question. I love I think it. I'd go Malik or A-Chan. Malik is mine for sure. Yeah. If, if Tua wasn't hurt, I would say A-Chan for sure. Yeah. Malik's just a di- – like, his body just contorts and moves in different ways, dude. He's doing the unthinkable, honestly. Yeah, agreed. Kyler would be up there for me, too. I love Kyler. Kyler's fun. Yeah. All right. Well, if you enjoyed, make sure you hit the button that looks like this. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And we will see y'all on Saturday for the private Q&A, which you will get access to if you go download the Underdog Fantasy app using our code BDG8. Good luck in week four. Love you. Nothing you can do about it. Thanks.